This is the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. And now, A Brief History with Christine Morgan. Hi, I'm historian Christine Morgan, and welcome to A Brief History. On this episode, we continue with part three of the story of Henry VIII from the book London in the Time of Tudors by Sir Walter Besant. As a trigger warning to listeners this week, the subject matter deals mostly with the executions conducted during the reign of Henry VIII. While our author does not write gruesome details, the concepts of execution by various means and violence are part of this episode. And with that, we now continue with our story. There were in this reign, for the admiration of the people, an extraordinary number of executions, both of noble lords and hapless ladies, as well as of divines, monks, friars, gentlewomen, gentlemen, and the common sort, for treason, heresy, and the crimes which are the most commonly brought before the attention of justice. What reign before this would exhibit such a list as the following? Two queens, Anne Boleyn and Catherine Howard, of others, the Marquis of Exeter, the Earl of Surrey, Earl of Kildare, Duke of Buckingham, Lord Rochford, Lady Rochford, Lady Salisbury, Fisher, Moore, Dudley, Cromwell. Of abbots, priors, monks, friars, doctors, priests, for refusing the oath of the king's supremacy, a great number. Of lesser persons for heresy or treason, another goodly company. Some were beheaded, those were fortunate. Others were burned, not being so fortunate. The rest were drawn on hurdles, treated in the manner we have already seen. The dissolution of the religious houses, the changes in the articles of religion, and their effect upon the city of London will be found in another place. But in this chapter, a few cases are given to illustrate the changes of thought and the general excitement in the minds of men. There is first the case of Lambert. He was a learned man and a schoolmaster who denied the real presence in the sacrament. The case had already been brought before the archbishop, who had given a sentence against Lambert. The king, who ardently believed in the real presence, announced his intention of arguing publicly with this heretic. The argument was actually held in Westminster Hall in the presence of a great number of people. In the end, The king apparently got the worst of it, for we find him becoming judge as well as disputant, and ordering the unfortunate man to recant or burn. Lambert would not recant. The pride and stubbornness of those heretics were wonderful. In some cases, perhaps in this, the man stood for a party. He would not recant for the sake of his friends as well as himself. He was burned. The case of Anne Askew is remarkable for the introduction of torture, which was then unusual either with criminals or heretics. She was so miserably tortured, yet perhaps the torture was intended as a merciful act in the hope of rescuing her from worse than earthly flames. But at the end, she could not stand or walk. She, like Lambert, suffered for denying the real presence She was a gentlewoman of very good understanding. This brief interruption is brought to you by, well, me. Do you love Tudor's Dynasty? Consider becoming a patron on Patreon. Patrons get access to all kinds of amazing things that the everyday listener does not. Find out more by going to Patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Tudor's Dynasty, and click Become a Patron for details. All right, back to the show. The Holy Maid of Kent, Elizabeth Barton, was a woman of a much lower order. She was hysterical and weak-minded. At the present day, she would be looked after and gently cared for. She had fits and convulsions during which her face and body were drawn, and she talked rambling nonsense. That she was unintelligible was quite enough to make the ignorant country folk flock about her, listening for inspired words in her hysterics. She passed among them for one to whom God had sent a new revelation of his will and intentions. 
She was taken to see bishops Fisher and Moore, who do not seem to have regarded her as a person of the slightest importance. But certain priests, it is said so, one may believe it or not, obtained influence over her and persuaded her to prophesy. No doubt she believed what they told her, that if the king took another wife, he would not remain king for another year. Henry, however, was not the man to be turned aside from his fixed purpose by such a gross cheat. He arrested the maid and her accomplices. They were all brought to the star chamber and examined. They all confessed. They were then exposed on a scaffold at St. Paul's and publicly confirmed their confessions. Her confederates included six ecclesiastics, of whom two were monks of Canterbury, one a friar observant, two were private gentlemen, and one was a serving man. Confession made, they were taken back to the tower, and their case laid before Parliament, which met after Christmas. They were all sentenced to the same traitor's death, and after being kept in prison for three months, were carried out to Tyburn. The last words of the girl, if they are correctly reported, are very pathetic and to the purpose, but they look as though they may have been written for her. Quote, Heather am I come to die, and I have not been the only cause of my own death, which most justly I have deserved, but also I am the cause of the death of all these persons, which at this time here suffer. And yet to say the truth, I am not so much to be blamed, considering it was well known unto these learned men, that I was a poor wench without learning, and therefore they might have easily perceived that the things that were done by me could not proceed in no such sort, but their capacities and learning could right well judge from whence they were proceeded, and that they were altogether feigned. But because the things which I feigned was profitable unto them, and therefore they much praised me, and bare me in hand that it was the Holy Ghost, and not that I... Did those things, and then my being puffed up with their praises fell into a certain pride and foolish fantasy with myself, and thought I might feign what I would, which thing hath brought me to this case. And for the which now I cry God and the King's Highness most heartily mercy, and desire all you good people to pray to God to have mercy on me, and all them that suffer here with me. End quote. One cannot refrain in this place from remarking on the change which has come over the temper of the people as regards the sacred person of the priest. Henry VII would not send to execution even those mischievous priests who invented and carried out the impudent personations. Yet his son, thirty years later, sends to block, stake, or gallows the bishops, abbots, priors, priests, monks, and friars by the dozen. The story of Richard Hun illustrates the condition of popular feeling which made these executions of ecclesiastics possible. He was a citizen of good position and considerable wealth. A merchant tailor by calling, he was greatly respected by the poorer sort on account of his charitable disposition. He was a good almsman and relieved the needy. It happened that one of his children, an infant, died and was buried. The curate asked for the bearing sheet as a mortuary. Richard Hun replied that the child had no property in the sheet. The reply shows either bad feelings towards the curate or bad feelings towards the clergy generally. Most likely it was the latter, as the sequel shows. The priest cited him before the spiritual court. He replied by counsel suing the curate. In return, Hun was arrested on a charge of lollardry and put into Lambeth Palace. Here shortly afterwards he was found dead. He had hanged himself, said the bishop and the chancellor, but the people began to murmur. Why should so good a man hang himself? The coroner's inquest was held upon the body, and the jury indicted the chancellor and two men, bell ringer, and the summoner for murdering Richard Hun. The king's attorney, however, would go no further into the matter. By the bishop's orders, the body was burned at Smithfield, but the murder, if it was a murder, 
of Richard Hun was not forgotten, nor was it forgotten that without a trial his body was burned as a heretic's. These things lay in the minds of the people, and they rankled. In the matter of the king's divorce, the city, or the populace, had taken a very strong side in favor of Queen Catherine. It may indeed be true that the king's conscience was awakened, after all these years of marriage, to the legality of marrying his brother's widow. He saw not, perhaps, in the failure of male heirs as a sign of the divine displeasure. That may be. It is not possible to understand all the motives which guide a man. To the outside world, the simplest motive always seems the certain motive. Catherine was no longer young, no longer beautiful. Anne Boleyn was both. When the second marriage was announced, the citizens were greatly displeased, partly on account of their sympathy with Catherine, partly because they remembered that Anne was the granddaughter of a mayor, one of themselves. No honor is ever felt to be conferred upon the people by the marriage of a prince with one of themselves, but quite the reverse. Edward IV and James II are examples as well as Henry VIII. So much did the citizens show their disgust that at an Easter sermon, some of them went out of the church before the prayers for the queen were read. The king sent word to the mayor about it. He called the guilds together and bade them cease murmuring against the king's marriage. Yet on the 29th of May, the queen passed from Greenwich to the tower, and on the 31st from the tower to Westminster. The city hastened on this occasion to show their loyalty by preparing a splendid reception for the queen. The pageant is described in part here. Quote, the Princess Elizabeth was born in September of the same year, 1533. In the spring of the following year, Parliament passed an act of succession declaring that she, and not Mary, was heir to the crown. The whole of the citizens took the oath in acknowledgment of this act. If any were so hardy as to refuse, they were executed. Of pageants and writings, no reign ever saw so many, nor was the city ever more honored in the part in which it was invited to take in them. Here, for instance, is a list of more important events. The coronation in 1509, the reception of French ambassadors in 1518, the reception of Emperor Charles in 1522, the coronation of Anne Boleyn, everyone an occasion for the display of sumptuous tapestry, gold chains, and allegorical groups. Two of these functions stand out above all others, the coronation of Anne and the christening of her child. Let us take the account of water pageant as furnished by Grafton. Quote, the 19th day of May, the mayor and his brethren, all in scarlet, and such as were knights, had collars of S's, and the remnant, having good chains, and the council of the city with them assembled at St. Mary Hill. Then there was a barge, which was garnished with many goodly banners and instruments, and continually made good harmony. First, before the mayor's barge, was a foist, in which there was a great dragon continually moving and casting wild fire, and round about the said foist stood terrible monsters and wild men casting fire and making hideous noises. Next, after the foist, a good distance, came the mayor's barge, on whose right hand was the bachelor's barge, in the which were trumpets and diverse other melodious instruments. The decks of the said barge and the top castles were hanged with rich cloth of gold and silk. Then there were two great banners with the arms of the king and the queen. At three of the clock, the queen appeared in rich cloth of gold and entered into her barge, accompanied with diverse ladies and gentlewomen, set forward in their order, the musicians continually playing and the bachelor's barge going on the queen's right hand, which she took great pleasure to behold. About the queen's barge, there were many noblemen, such as the Duke of Suffolk, her father, the Earl's Arundel, Derby, Rutland, Sussex, Oxford, and many bishops and noblemen, every one in his barge, which was a goodly sight to behold. 
She thus being accompanied rode toward the tower, and in the mean ways the ships which were commanded to lie on the shore for letting of the barges shot diverse peals of guns, and she landed and there was a marvelous shot out of the tower as ever was heard there. And at her landing there met with her the Lord Chamberlain with the officers of arms, and they brought her to the king, who received her with loving countenance by the waterside. He kissed her, and then she turned back again and thanked the mayor and the citizens with many goodly words, and so entered the tower. End quote. The execution of Anne Boleyn and the succession of Henry's queens may be passed over here as belonging to the national history. As always, I want to thank you, dear listeners, for tuning in, not to just a brief history, but also to the Tudors' dynasty. Thank you for supporting all of these podcasts. I hope you'll tune in for our next episode, which will be about the final years of Henry VIII's reign and the beginning of his son, Edward VI's reign in London. Until next time, I'm Christine Morgan. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. You can follow and support the Tudor's Dynasty podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Patreon at Tudor's Dynasty. 